Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Christopher Rocchio. I'm the author of the Sun of Your Science Fantasy Series from Doll Books and a seven-year veteran of the publishing industry. And today we're going to do, uh, you know, something a little bit experimental. I've got my friends uh, DJ Butler and uh, Jordan Hill of the iWizard channel here with us this evening to answer a question that Jordan and I did not get to when uh, we were together over on his channel a couple, couple weeks ago now. And that is, uh, you know, what makes great fantasy? But before we get to any of that stuff, I figured I would let you guys... Uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, uh, why don't we start with you, Dave? Um, oh, no pressure. Uh, so uh, I'm Dave. Uh, as DJ Butler, I publish uh, science fiction and fantasy for adults, principally with Bane. Um, I've got a science fiction novel called Abbott and Darkness coming out in about two weeks. So I'm Jordan. I run the iWizard BookTube channel with my wife, with my wife Nikki, and I'm a teacher. Uh, from time to time, I publish articles varied at various different um, outlets. Uh, I have a degree in philosophy, and so I like to think about fantasy literature from that perspective, and uh, just uh, really happy to be here. Yeah, well, I'm glad to have you both here. Like I said, uh, I was on I was on Jordan's channel a couple weeks ago to talk about King of Death, which came out, uh, gosh, over a month ago already, and um, or nearly over a month ago. Uh, I'm losing count. Uh, and, uh, and, and you were lamenting Jordan that we like never ask questions like what makes great literature, right? Especially in science fiction and fantasy. And I laughed because Dave and I have had this conversation, you know, a hundred times and I thought it would be really cool to get the two of you together and to talk about it in general. It seemed like a, a nice different thing to do. And so I guess, uh, I guess the question is, uh, what makes great fantasy, you know, like, why don't we just start there and see where we go? Um, so what, uh. I, I guess I guess in the spirit of starting things, I guess we should like set aside like the obvious stuff, right? Like what makes great literature generally is, you know, like we don't talk about prose, right? You know, or anything like that. But um, but uh, what do you think is maybe special about fantasy? Maybe that's the right place to start. Um, uh, I'm deferring to the guy with the philosophy degree. I feel all yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah, uh, yeah. You're, you're the you're the yeah. expert. No. <laughs> All right. So first of all, I just wanted to say, Christopher and uh, and Dave, thanks for for doing this. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for hosting this, Christopher. And especially, Christopher, thanks for following up on our discussion and uh, and choosing this topic. Uh, in particular, I feel like it's this is not something that you see enough uh, enough of a discussion of at fantasy conventions. You have these fantasy panels that are like harder soft magic systems or what is grim dark or representation in fantasy and sci-fi. And all of that's fine by me, but I see it as a problem, I guess, uh, Christopher, that we're no longer asking the big questions. And I'll clarify, I guess, what I mean by that. We're asking descriptive questions rather than normative ones, which I see generally as a sign of uh, artistic and literary uh, cultural decline, I guess. Descriptive obviously means what is the case versus normative, which is the question of what ought to be the case. And the fact that we're at this point and we're so um, morally and aesthetically relativistic that we feel like we can only ask about um, what is, right? The what is. It's like, so um, all this grimdark stuff has been published. Now it's our job to ask, what is it? Uh, what is hard sci-fi? What's soft sci-fi? What are agents looking for? What are the most annoying fantasy tropes? And like, all of that is fine. But I think the fact that we're limited to how do I feel about what is already the case, uh, to me, this is an impoverished way of engaging with culture and art. Uh, and by the way, guys, both of you, I was scanning YouTube today just to see, like, are there booktubers who are out there talking about this? And they're really not. Uh, and it's no wonder because we inhabit this culture where we feel like we we have to qualify everything we say with, guys, this is just my opinion. I I'm not making a universal claim about what kind of art best speaks to the human condition. What is the telos of fantasy literature? What should be its its purpose or function. Um, I'm not trying to tell you what is universally great. Uh, instead, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, we, we kind of, we, we, we apologize before we make our case. We say, I know everything is 
super subjective and there's no such thing as universal aesthetic standards. Everything's socially constructed. But I, you know, I just feel like that shouldn't be the case. Uh, you know, the attitude out there is that there is no way of saying that Shakespeare is a better writer than James Patterson, because who are we to say? Who are we peons to say? And I just think, guys, I just think that this is intellectual Philistinism, and I think it's indicative of a, a decadent culture. And I'll just say this one last thing, guys. I know I'm being long-winded. I'll start this conversation off brief and straight to the point by saying uh, that one of the things, in my opinion, that makes – oh, look, I did it. I did it there, in my opinion. One of the things that makes for great fantasy literature is – what I would like to call a world worth saving. So much fantasy literature th will throw you into a world. You get to meet the, the main characters. They're sword fighting or they're preparing for their trial, their rite of passage into adulthood. And, you, and so you get to have some familiarity, I guess, with the characters, but you're not necessarily given a sense of what is worth fighting for. What moral notions are we willing to die for? Why is why is the village that I live in worth dying for? What is goodness in this world? Um, what is beauty? What is truth? What is justice? Why is the bad guy doing uh, what he's doing? Uh, where is he coming from? And I feel like these questions need to be answered. And for example, I'm reading right now, I'm reading uh, as, as those on Mike's uh, books discord will know I'm reading the Lycanius trilogy by James Islington and I'm totally entertained. I'm having a great time with it. The plot is quick and engaging. The magic system is interesting. The world uh, is very compelling. Uh, and so it's, it's dragging me along, but I have no idea what anyone stands for, why they're willing to endure the hardships that they're willing to endure, why it all matters. And I feel like I need to know that. And lastly, I promise, and you, and you're going to like this, Christopher, you know, who is good at doing this? J.R.R. Tolkien is good at doing this because the plot of the Lord of the Rings tells you why Middle Earth needs to be saved. This, to me, is one of the most important things. And you, you, you see this in the first half of the book. The, the Council of Elrond chapter is this kind of cutoff point, and it gives you a chance to like rest. It's that stress and release pattern that Ursula Le Guin talks about. And think about all that we've been through and the friendships and Bilbo's party and, and the Shire and the friendship of Sam and Frodo and just all the stuff that we've been through. Tolkien first gives you a sense of what is at stake. And then he says, here's the evil dark lord bad guy and here's what's at stake. And it's a long-winded way of saying that I think first and foremost, we have to know what we're fighting for. Yeah, I I totally agree. I don't want to uh, go ahead. I, I think you should know uh, Madison is in the chat and she's already thanking you for taking us to church. So uh, preach on, uh, Jordan. Uh, and I, I don't want to be the guy who ignores either. Uh, we got a super chat. Uh, falling outside the normal moral constraints. Uh, thank you, man. Uh, cheers to Butler for Appalachian representation in fantasy with witchy eye. It's proud of Appalachian. It's nice to get some love. Um, so I don't want to ignore that, but, um, but good. Yeah. I was going to ask how to respond because I don't seem to be able to type in the chat. So, okay. Very oh, good. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know what it looks like on your end. Do you not have the comments bar on the side or I do when I'm in the comments bar, but there's nowhere for me to chat and no button for chatting. I just, I can see this, this, the, uh, the scroll. Uh, well, we are we are learning, but he can hear you, so we got that. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's that's <laughs> fantastic. I love Appalachia. No, clearly I'm not from there. Uh, it's an adopted homeland. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So so look. So uh, fantasy literature has by and large abandoned its post, uh, and I think in some cases uh, it has done so in an act of uh, deliberate uh, rebellion. So fantasy literature has a heart. Um, and uh, it is that it is the what if literature of the human spirit. And uh, it should be, as Tolkien is, about spiritual verities, about telling spiritual truths and making surprising spiritual connections and teaching people about the moral universe and about the, uh, the, uh, the, the universe of archetypes within them, right? Uh, and uh, and and about the sort of the cosmos, and and Tolkien is that in spades, right? Tolkien said about himself, "I am worried 
uh, about the Lord of the Rings. I'm worried no one can possibly like this book. It is too Catholic. Um, and uh, and fantasy has has chosen not to do that. Um, and I think there are two major heresies over the last, uh, I don't know, 40 years. And, and you've touched on them both. Uh, let me explicate what I think are the two major heresies. Uh, one is Grimdark. Uh, Grimdark does make statements about cosmology and the verities, but it does it like a college sophomore. What it says is, oh, man, nothing is true. There's no God. You want to sleep with me, baby? That's what Grimdark <laughs> is. Okay? Uh, it's just, it's posturing. And it's empty. It goes nowhere. It's embarrassing. It's been around as long as it has. I understand why it's a breath of fresh air. If you're used to opening a fantasy novel and you know that the hero is going to live until the end, and you know that he is going to complete his quest. I understand it is a breath of fresh air and even like a, even like an important tonic to occasionally have a book where that doesn't happen. But to have this go on for decades is ridiculous. Okay. Um, and, and I think it's of our age. I think we live in a relativistic age that, that wants to deny virtue in favor of values and truths in favor of, uh, you know, uh, 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 trendy ideas, right? We live in a kind of a TED Talk age. Nothing can be hard to learn. Nothing can be true in a deep, uh, meaningful way. Everything should be learnable in five minutes. So, um, so I think that's one. I think that's one of the heresies. Okay, here's the other heresy. Uh, hard magic. Hard magic. Let me try and use some technical language here. Hard magic is giant bullshit. Uh, so uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, fantasy, Severian, I think that's actually true. Of course, the new normal is the new normal as articulated through uh, publishing, which is a, you know, which is the, which is the, the eye of the needle. Uh, that uh, the, the camel of ordinary culture is trying to go through. Maybe that's a strange metaphor. Uh, so I don't think the new normal means that's what every person out there thinks. But I do think publishing expresses a very narrow point of view and maybe narrower. Um, here's the problem with hard magic, okay? It, the problem is that it isn't magic at all. And, and it's not accidental that fantasy literature is a... Uh, that's right, Liam. It's not accidental that fantasy literature is a spiritual genre because magic, magic is notoriously hard to define. You read what academics say about magic and people, uh, it, it ends up being like the, the, the Supreme Court quip about pornography. I know it when I see it. It's kind of what people can say, right? And there are all kinds of idea about, about ideas about what is magic and, and they, they're interesting. Potter yeah. Stewart. Sorry, say again. Potter Stewart. Potter, they're very good. Potter Stewart. Yeah, I know it when I see it. Uh, so um, some people think it's the unconscious mind's um, intrinsic reaction to uh, trauma that later gets ritualized, right? Uh, clearly, in many cases, it's a place where two in, two two cultures encounter each other, and and one culture takes the religion of the other. And, and interprets it as magic. This is literally where our word comes from, by the way. The Greek magia means the religion of the magoi. Those fire priests over in Iran. Magic is when we do what they do, right? Literally what it means. Uh, and uh, and, and, and uh, every definition of magic, okay, uh, they, they all lie close to, like academic definitions, they lie close to the human spirit. Magic is close to religion. At the border, it's hard to tell them apart. Magic is close to science. At some borders, it's hard to tell them apart. Newton was accused of being a magician, which, by the way, he was, uh, because of the idea of gravity. He said, I, look, I don't know why, uh, but the objects operate on each other at a distance. That's a violation of Aristotelian physics. It was an occult idea, right? So, so. Um, Magic in literature is powerful because it lies so close to the human spirit. And it lets us articulate things, uh, sometimes imagistically, where uh, um, about the spirit, spiritual verities and truth. Well, when you replace that with this 
Oh, uh, if I touch the color purple, I can fly. But if I touch blue, I am strong. One day, by the way, I'm going to write a parody. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a middle grade book. It's going to be called The Nutter. And it's going to be a kid who has different superpowers depending on what nut he eats. And the hell of it is he's allergic to nuts. So uh, one day I will write that book. <laughs> but, uh, but that's not magic. That's just not magic, right? Yeah, there's no illumination. There's no insight. It's got nothing to do with the human soul. It's BS. What it is, is this dilution where you go, here's fantasy literature. Then we create a and d game from it. But that's too, the rules are too fuzzy. So we create Magic the Gathering from that. And then Hard Magic is the, is the bastard offspring of Magic the Gathering. And, and again, that's not to say there's anything wrong with those games. If and, you play, and look, no, I don't game. like games. I um, love games. I don't play but, Magic particularly, but I play a lot of games. But it has no power. Neither One is a lie. Uh, Grimdark is a lie. Hard Magic has no power because it isn't really fantasy. It isn't really talking about the human spirit. Yeah, now, events. I, I, I do uh, maybe feel like we should say that's not to say that there can't be, like, dark stories, right? But it's the sort of intrinsic, like, like you said, talk more kind of nihilism that that sort of stabs at the, the heart of what fantasy is or used to be. Even even stuff that was, you know, pre-Tolkien, right? If you read if you read Howard, right? It's not it's not nihilistic. It's certainly you know maybe adult in a way that Tolkien isn't, right? So I, I understand there's a lot of a lot of anti-Tolkien sentiment is wrapped up in this idea that he's for kids, right? Because of course, you know, optimism is for kids. Uh, but it, but you know, I, I, I do understand the sort of reflexive thing people get where they, where they say, well, hang on, right. You're saying we can't have, you know, dark stories or, you know, something like, of course not. Right. You know, my work is, is, is incredibly dark in, you know, in, in, at times, but there's a sort of, um, sort of like a moral, like, like locus, right. Like a bunch of, of, of tropes sort of collecting that kind of makes, uh, if Grimdark is a genre, right, it makes it a genre, uh, is it, sort of like that attitude, right, that, and that hopelessness, which is something um, that I, I feel like we should delineate, because I don't want people to think that we're, like, against, you know, books for grown-ups or something, if they're just wandering in. Um, but no, one thing but of course, that, look, it's oh, low-hanging fruit, though, right? The, like, the response to that is easy and obvious. I mean, J.R.R. Tolkien fought in the Somme and lost friends there. Right. Uh, and, and wrote a vision about... Uh, mankind uniting to stand up against moral moral sorry against uh, industrialized warfare and evil right at the great cost to itself um he is described in this kind of rubric as uh as being the juvenile one whereas george martin avoided the draft uh had a career in hollywood and writes a book about everyone is evil and will screw you and that's supposed to be the the uh, mature vision and i find that profoundly backwards if people just want to see you know naked stuff right if that's the issue we have a name for that genre too yeah 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 <laughs> dave dave um uh, what you what you say brings up a, i think an important point i was watching uh youtube uh and i showed i showed actually showed one of my i showed my fantasy and sci-fi class this clip of uh george r, r. martin talking to stephen king the video has been viewed you know, like a million times, you know, it's, it's that popular video where they're both going back and forth for a couple of hours. And, um, there's, and George R. R. Martin says at one point that, you know, he finds, he loves Tolkien, obviously, you know that, but he finds Tolkien to be morally simplistic. And he says that Tolkien, uh, externalizes evil, um, that by placing, by placing evil in, you know, Mordor and just placing all evil in Sauron, um, uh, that that's morally simplistic or something like that. And I, I just think that that ignores basically the entire story. It ignores for yeah. Well, of course, right. It ignores all the internalized evil. It, right? ignores, it, it, it ignores Wormtongue. It ignores Denethor. It ignores Boromir. Right. Uh, you know, and some of those characters aren't even like Boromir is not bad. Right. He just has a bad day. Right. Like it completely brushes aside yep. all of the moral complexity that's in the Lord of the Rings. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's such a frustrating take. Uh, and I think, isn't that the same point where he follows up with like, you know, we like we don't know about like Aragorn's tax plan, 
uh, I think it's the same the same speech. And and I'm like that is not also something fantastic about taxes, man. Like I don't I don't want I don't want the the Gondor small council meeting, right? Like um, it's just something about that attitude baffles me. Um, sorry, I stopped your roll. Um, no, you're good. That's what exactly what I was going to say, Christopher. And I also just wanted to touch on what what Dave was saying is that I and I agree with you, Christopher. I don't think that we need to take. I I I happen to like George R. R. Martin. George R. R. Martin is my favorite uh, living fantasy author. I get a lot of flack for that. Um, but the reason that I are find you sure he's alive? What's that? Oh, I know, I know. Well, you could be forgiven for thinking that he isn't, but. My point is that, so obviously in Lord of the Rings, we know what the characters are fighting for. The hobbits are fighting for the Shire uh, and friendship in a very, as you pointed out, Dave, a very sp specific sense uh, of how the world should be, which of course is infused with Tolkien's Catholicism. Uh, Gandalf and the elves and men tell us quite literally what they are fighting for, which is basically freedom and justice and rule of law and sovereignty, um, love, uh, the, the lightness and a sense of the common good, that sort of thing. But my point is that um, agreeing with both of you guys, even in Song of Ice and Fire, we get a really sharp and well-defined sense of what characters are fighting for. You know uh, that the Starks are defending their home and their way of life and their past and the rightful order of things. And for everyone else, I will admit the Lannisters, the Baratheons, um, uh, even for Danny, it's about power. Um, but that's how things are. Um, I guess for Danny, it's also about revenge and her family and stuff like that. But ultimately, book one is called Game of Thrones. We know it's about uh, power, it's Machiavellian, and that's fine because it's well defined and it's well fleshed out. And we get a sense of what they're fighting for. But so much of what I'm reading today um, drops you into the world, introduces you to these, you know, moderately remotely charming characters and then they go on this journey and you're just really not sure what they're fighting for you're really not sure why they're hiking hundreds of miles and why they're going through what they're going through and i think that's uh and i agree with everything you said dave uh but i also think that it's it's even deeper than that and i think that that's i, I think there's a kind of flaw in the way that a lot of these authors are approaching i don't mean to i, I sound so negative i'm dragging everyone but uh i guess that's kind of my uh my position it's usually my job yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> there's uh there's an interesting point though right like within the cast of game of thrones right because you're you're right the the um the starks are fighting for something that matters and it does it does matter right that because especially as they get scattered right the kids want to go home right and they want and that home is effectively gone by the end right and and, and this is one of the things that frustrates me about that series. Because I love the first three books, and I know it's become popular to dislike the last two because of the way they got split, but which I have a lot of sympathy for. Uh, having a books four and five that are also split, but um, but that sort of that home is gone, right? And they like, and, and there is still a story uh, to tell about rebuilding it or reclaiming it, and maybe that is where the books are going. But it feels to me like that sort of like the Shire of the Stark children uh, is is totally gone in a way that Frodo Shire was only partially destroyed, right? And I, maybe it's wrong to pass sentence on the books because you know they're not done, right? Uh, but uh, I, if, if the ending is the ending in the show, right, which nobody likes. <laughs> um, you know, then I uh, then I I do wonder, right? You know, if if there's anything left uh, in in Westeros, because I often with with like sequels, right? Like when a story is over, one of the markings of a good ending for me is if I wish there were more stories when there aren't, right? And I don't feel that way where uh, where the show has left us, which is not the fault of of, of the author, right? You know, uh, and so I I don't know I don't know about that, but um one it's of the things oh go ahead dave so it's essential that frodo and the other hobbits come home and scour the shire right this is the this is the pattern of a good myth is that the village is is sick and the heroes have to leave the village find the solution and come back to heal the village or the village is stagnant and it is 
it's in a kind of stasis and the hero has to leave the ordered conservative ordered homeland and enter the domain of chaos and slay the dragon and bring back the bring back fertility to the homeland sure so, sure it's yeah. just another kind of sickness right so the uh the, you see this in the odyssey too uh odysseus has to come home and he has to set things right with telemachus and penelope because that's the point that's the value of going on this quest is you come back and put the home back in order so um so so that's interesting i fr look frankly frankly i gave up on game of thrones i concluded that the author hated human beings and stopped reading so i don't i don't have any sense about you know whether there's a home left for the stark children or not but i think that's an interesting point christopher yeah, and, yeah. And dave dave I, I think too what's interesting is i totally agree with you obviously whereas the iliad is a Kleos epic the odyssey is a nostos epic it's coming home and it's you know uh 20 years of fighting to return home and of course you have to remember on ithaca one of the interesting things is that ithaca has been taken all the all the men on the on the island of ithaca have left to to go fight in the trojan war and so all of the young boys have been raised without fathers and which is why they're wily and they're you know they are insubordinate and they're trying to uh bed penelope and um you know one of the interesting things is that if you flash forward then to alfred lord tennyson who writes ulysses you know a, a little prophets that an idol king by his still hearth and his uh aged wife i met in dull punishment onto a savage race what you have in modernity then is you have uh ulysses of course taking the Roman uh, name, Ulysses is complaining about his duties, is complaining about having to set his homeland in order, is complaining about having to uh, dole out uh, justice. And he is, he is, uh, he is soliloquizing about, uh, about the fact that he just wants to escape from his responsibilities and go sailing with his war buddies again uh, to follow knowledge like a sinking star and all this stuff. And it really does show you the the uh, it, it reminds me of uh, Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue, the kind of message in that book. But uh, I wonder what you think about that. And if you've read that poem, Dave. Um, I have not read the poem. I think that's a very interesting take. I, I like the idea that the uh, suitors are uh, fatherless uh, sons. I think that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. There's a question here for you, Dave. Uh, Corey here is asking, I've seen authors talk a lot about wonder with magic, but they seem to conflate it with obfuscation. Uh, you can define it a little, but defining it doesn't make it automatically wondrous. Can you maybe address the point about wonder and obfuscation because that is usually the that is usually the rebuttal, right? Is that uh, you know, uh, people don't want uh, you know, um, they don't want it to be like, they feel like if you haven't explained something, then the book is bad. Right. Um, well, th there's, there's a rebuttal that goes something like this. Well, if I, if I can't measure it, then it doesn't feel real or it doesn't feel like the author is being held accountable. But that again is to use technical language bullshit because look, you, you're, you don't go along in the story going, he had consumed 1400 calories. He, and he had only had so many ounces of bread left in his belly to consume. Could he make it up the mountain? You don't do that, right? Uh, you, you talk in terms that human that, that relates to human subjective experience. Um, I think I think, and Corey doesn't doesn't quite ask a question, but I think it's a really interesting observation. I don't think magic is wonder. I think you should experience something like wonder. But I think if you uh, if you take if you take seriously the problem that academics have defining magic then when you like in other words that that's indicative of something about what the nature of magic is and where it lives in our perceptions then i think the magic that feels the most real will be magic where you look at it in the page and you go, you go man there's just there's a fine line between this and religion and like at another angle it feels kind of weirdly like science uh and and there is also sociology in here and there are inequities of social power uh buried in here or being expressed uh and uh and and there's a there's a response to the emotion states of the person who's doing it right like all of that should feel in the most authentic magic system 
I think if you feel that, you're not going to go, oh, no, the guy had seven steel beans left to burn, not four, right? Like, that's just this, that's just dumb. I did, for the record, like Miss Borg. It was the first Sanderson I'd read, but then everything else was the same. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. It's like reading that one nihilistic book where you go, okay, this is a good palate cleanser. It reminds me that, you know kind of charges me with skeptical energy again but the problem is it just kept being the same thing and so i i quit on him he doesn't care he's rich they're both rich it doesn't hurt them neither one of them's gonna watch this <laughs> well that's probably true um there was a thing i wanted to say though just in, in sort of trying to define or distinguish fantasy which i guess is the same thing from you know the the rest of literature right and i am um, Dave, I think I've done my like vampires are real rant to you before, and it's not like a, it's not like a, it's not really a rant. It's very short, but I, I kind of got laughed off of a panel once at Dragon Con for insisting that vampires 100% totally exist, uh, you know. Uh, and then everyone laughed at me. I said, "Well, you know, ladies, you've all dated at least one, right?" And then everyone understood, <laughs> right? Like there's there's like a level of reality that's like above ours, right? Which I guess is literally super in the sense of the word you know meaning above na and nature right where there are these like sort of platonic categories of things that exist right like vampires exist those types of dudes run around you know sucking the life out of people uh you know and they're not all the same but they're all kind of like they kind of like fit into this sort of platonic you know archetype right uh, you know, same with like, like dragons are totally real, right? Especially in prehistoric times, like people got eaten by cats or lit on fire or they got bitten by snakes or there was some rich dude who amassed ho hordes of gold in his castle and he stole virgins, right? Like, like those people are all acting in like the spirit of a dragon, right? Those phenomena are all acting in that way. And what I think distinguishes fantasy, right? Because what's interesting about fantasy is that it doesn't really exist as a genre like until people start getting less religious right is that it is the form of literature that like engages with that symbolic language that symbolic layer literally like dragons are literally on the page as dragons they're not like the dragon in thomas harris right the serial killer right it's literally a dragon and so there's something that's like really honest like fundamentally honest about fantasy like it, it's sort of like the you know the red-headed stepchild in academia right like everyone's like this is silly stuff for kids right which is the same thing that fantasy fans who don't really like tolkien say about tolkien but i i digress right but there's there's something that's that's just very honest about the fact that this sort of symbolic layer that's like totally real and we all act like it's real right we all are like oh man like if you've ever been like around a crime right or something like truly evil like there's something intrinsically supernatural about that experience it's like oh shit like i just touched something that was like way deeper and darker than you know normal existence and i fantasy puts that on the page in in like a in like a substantive way uh it's not hidden under a metaphor right it's it's like less metaphorical than uh than literary fiction right than realistic fiction because it takes those, they're not quite metaphors in real life and concretizes them. And I, I think that um, that fantasy is good when it brings that symbolic world onto the page uh, as it is, right? And I think that maybe some writers are more or less in touch with that kind of way of perceiving reality than others. But I, I think that to the degree that it does that, it's really great literature. And to the degree that it is a product uh you know that is meant to earn money then it's just not right and that's not to say right that like you can't be great literature and earn money or you know that you must be poor to be great right but uh, i i do think there's sort of a you know we talked about the like uh the, the the fantasy literature to board games pipeline right and and how that circles back around like so much modern fantasy is is like an eighth generation product right that that has that has lost touch with that that deeper sort of um you know that that deeper mythological religious symbolic layer to reality you don't need to be religious to like understand what i'm talking about it might help right 
uh, depending on, in, 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 and you don't need to, I don't care which religion you are, but you, it makes, I think, people more sensitive to this sort of way of thinking. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chris Trader well, says, interesting. you've been talking to Pajo again. I haven't in a while, actually, but I, I uh, Jonathan has been very influential in my way of, uh, my way of thinking. Um, but I, um, but I do, uh, I do feel that way. Right. So, um, it's, I think that's what makes that fantasy great. When I was a kid, there was a family that lived down the uh, street is not the right word, but lived on a country road outside of Ithaca, New York. And the family that lived at the foot of the hill um, had no religion at all. And so they had deliberately chosen to adopt the Lord of the Rings as their Bible. It was going to be the source of their moral teachings. You could awesome. do worse. Oh, you could do much worse. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're crypto Catholic at that point. You just don't know it, which I think is awesome. Um yeah, there's a, uh, I guess I have two thoughts. I, I don't know, maybe that neither of these is responsive. There's a C.S. Lewis quote, and I'm going to, I'm paraphrasing from memory, so I don't know, I, I may be off slightly, but it's something like this. Children don't need to read fairy stories to learn that there are monsters in the world. They already know that there are monsters in the world. They need to read fairy stories to learn that there are knights. Uh, and uh, I think that's... Um, I think that's an important truth, and I think that gets back to some of the earliest comments Jordan was making about the abdication of uh, moral, um, well, of morality, of believing in a moral position, right? Um, and here's another point. I don't know. Uh, Nassim Taleb, in his book Anti Fragile, this is the guy who write the, wrote the Black Swan. Black Swan. Yeah. Okay. He talks about uh, a rough rule of thumb. So I'm going to say something to offer hope. That's what I'm going to say. Okay, is a rough one of his rough heuristics. His rough rules of thumb is things that have been around time, a long time tend to last a lot longer, right? Uh, why? Because we know that they work. So, for example, if you had to pick, so which is more likely to be here a hundred years from now, a table or an iPhone? The answer is clearly a table, right? Because tables have worked for thousands of years iPhones have worked for 10, right? Uh, tables are rugged. They work in earthquakes. We we have lots of experience with tables. They last. So I I am confident that, that fantasy will endure. I'm actually not sure we can live without it. I think maybe uh, in the absence uh, of unifying sacred texts, we create and seek unifying mythological texts of our own invention, right? Um uh notwithstanding that right now seems to be like a bad moment for for uh fantasy literature i'm surprised you chose nasim nicholas taleb over edmund burke who says basically the same thing just <laughs> you know throughout his whole career about inherited wisdom but that, i love everything that you said dave and and i want to touch on something that you said christopher as well there is a great essay that you guys have both probably read since your fantasy authors by Lloyd Alexander. Um, and I've talked about this on my channel before. It's called High, it's called High High Fantasy and High Fantasy and Heroic Romance, I think. And um, I believe this is actually the essay that popularizes the term high fantasy. And he makes this great point that poetry, dance, um, theater, comedy, tragedy, all of these forms of art that we take really seriously have their roots in ancient religious rituals. And he says that the first language of art was the language of magic and mythology. And that basically decoding that language is something that poets and philosophers and even in modern times, psychiatrists and philologists like Tolkien have always taken very seriously. And I think it's interesting that we read the Icelandic sagas, we read the, the Greek myths, Beowulf, we read the Song of Roland and medieval romances, we um, we get up to Edmund Spencer with the Fairy Queen and Margaret Cavendish with her Blazing World. And you can even go later and talk about 19th century, early 19th century, uh, you know, post, uh, you know, uh, uh, printing press literate 19th century fantasy, William Morris, The Well at World's End, uh, Lord Dunsany and things like that, even like George MacDonald. Uh, my point is that we take these authors very seriously in a way that we don't with modern fantasy. 
And I think in a sense, we're right to feel this way as much as I love fantasy, because you just get this sense that these authors were somehow closer to this world of heroes and gods and titans and magic and passions. And I mean, if you even think about someone like T.H. White, and if you compare him to someone like, you know, just pick Pick, a, pick the fantasy author that most people are going to be reading by the late 70s. Take um, Terry Brooks or something like that. And I admit this might be an unfair comparison, but I, I really don't think so because T.H. White is, is, a, is a modern author. He was publishing Once in Future Kings somewhere around 1960, right? 1959, something like that. But it's, it's interesting that we see T.H. White, we see Tolkien, we see C.S. Lewis, we see these authors as being these conjurers of something ancient, drawing from these legends and traditions and this very old source material. Um, uh, to to Tolkien actually calls it the pot of uh, soup, but I, I think in his essay, Lloyd Alexander calls it the cauldron of story. But I, uh, I actually, I actually brought a, a passage from this essay to read to you guys because I thought it was so relevant to the topic that we were discussing, and I'm going to read this to you. Uh, right now, I've got the essay right here. Yeah, go for it. So Alexander, Lloyd Alexander, you know, the fantasy author, he's talking about the pot of soup and he says, quote, the pot holds a rich and fascinating kind of mythological minestrone. Almost everything has gone into it and almost anything is likely to come out of it. Morsels of real history spiced and spliced with imaginary history, fact and fancy, daydreams and nightmares. It is as inexhaustible as those legendary vessels that could never be emptied. Among the most nourishing bits and pieces we can scoop out of the pot are whole assortments of characters, events, and situations that occur again and again in one form or another throughout much of the world's mythology. Heroes, villains, fairy godmothers, wicked stepmothers, princesses and pig keepers, prisoners and rescuers, ordeals and temptations, the quest for the magical object, a set of tasks to be accomplished, and a whole arsenal of cognominal swords, enchanted weapons, a wardrobe of cloaks of invisibility, seven Seven league boots, a whole zoo of dragons, helpful animals and birds and fish. And then he makes this point and he says, but in accordance with one of fantasy's own conventions, nothing, nothing is given for nothing. Although we're free and welcome to ladle up whatever suits our taste and fill ourselves with any mixture we please, nevertheless, we have to digest it, assimilate it as thoroughly as we assimilate the objective experiences of real life. As conscious artists, we have to process it on the most personal levels, let it work on our personalities, and above all, let our personalities work on it. Because these conventional characters, these personae of myth and fairy tale, though gorgeously costumed in comparison, are faceless. The writer must fill in their expressions. Colorful figures in a pantomime, the writer must give them a voice. And so I'm sorry to be uh, long-winded there with that. But my point is that up until very recently, what you might call fantasy literature is, is working with much older sources and materials and and traditions and stories up until the 60s with some exceptions i guess fantasy had very deep roots and then you get someone like terry brooks and again all due respect i think he actually did a lot for the genre but he's working with one source yeah. his roots are jrr tolkien to echo dave's point and you might say well if tolkien is working with these ancient traditions and Brooks is cribbing off Tolkien. Isn't that the same thing? And it's like, no, with Tolkien, the tree that you see is humble, but the roots are deep. The roots are profoundly deep with someone like Terry Brooks. The tree is massive. How many books has Terry Brooks written? I don't know. Well, 30 uh, some in the Shannara series. Right? right. But the roots are shallow and you do see talented writers who draw on these traditions writers. Even I like, but, but it just skates on the surface. It's like a garnish that they sprinkle on top of just of, of Tolkien, right? And so that's, I'm concerned with that about modern fantasy. I don't think it takes itself seriously enough. No. I it's think that's the difference, right? Because there's, I, I obviously have a target painted on my back here, right? As someone who, who does pull from more recent sources. And that's because I don't think ultimately that you shouldn't do that, right? Like you should... Uh, like, like there's still good stuff that's getting made. And, I, and I, I, I worry that when we go down, when anyone goes down this avenue, that people think or what's being said is that, right, like, oh, in the good old days when they told good stories as opposed to now when they told the crap. But we, the difference is, right, that there is, there's so much stuff that gets made now, right? 
Uh, you know, I, I think every time someone complains about a trope or a storytelling convention or something like that, right? Like, uh, I was thinking about Chosen Ones earlier, right? Like, we are never going to get rid of Chosen Ones, and people need to stop whining about them on the internet for a couple of reasons. One, it's, it's uh, well, a couple of reasons. One, and metaphysically, it's true, which I, I won't go into, right? Like, people are chosen for things. That happens, uh, you know? Uh, two, it's been around for a long time, so it will continue to be around, as Dave said. Um, but the third thing is that, like, never before the 20th century was anybody expected to consume hundreds of parallel mythological structures, right? Uh, you were not meant to, uh, like, nobody up until 19, really 1960s, 70s, was intimately familiar with the uh, sort of mythological stories of Southern Europe, Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Asia, uh, Africa, 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 Asia, 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 right? South America, no, right? To say nothing of the crazy people who made up their own stuff, right? Um, and so, like, you were meant to, like, be familiar with, like, one or two chosen one stories, right? We got Noah, we got Moses, we got Jesus, uh, we got, you know, Cyrus appearing as the Christ at one time in Isaiah, we're good, right? Uh, you know, we're done. Uh, you weren't supposed to, like, when I say supposed to, right, you, people did not read 400 books a year that were all retelling the same deep mythological structure. And I don't think that our brains have caught up to that change, right? And and so um, to try and bring this back to the point, right, like, I, I, I worry about sort of, um, uh, I worry about denigrating uh, modern work when we go this way, because I obviously, like Dave and I are producing it, right? So I don't want people to think that we're being hypocritical here. But, but Christopher, you are you are not, you're not one of the authors that I'm concerned about. You are... Well, I know that, but I, I do want to make it clear that I don't think I'm the only exception, right? Or, or, or that Dave and I are the only exceptions. Uh, because, because there are, there are a lot of writers that are doing good work and I just want to make sure in case anyone's hackles are going up, that that delineation gets, has been made. Um, so I just wanted to sort of put a big ass, hang an asterisk on the wall. <laughs> but you're, you're, um, you know, Christopher, your work is, you are working out of a tradition of modern kind of new wave slash pulpy uh, you know, pulp era sci-fi and you're kind of combining those two and you're working within the shell of that framework, but you're also drawing on such a deep and rich tradition. There's a real texture to your world. And so I just, I just want to point out that there's a way of doing this that, that evades the kind of, that kind of anxiety of influence and the kind of, um, that the kind of, error that i'm talking about i think that well, i wasn't fishing for that but i thank you <laughs> it didn't it doesn't feel like that with 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 your work you're talking about uh the roman empire and you're talking about you know like um you know herodotus and uh and in all of these it's it's such a, a vast kind of breadth of different thinkers and traditions and stories and 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 myths and 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 legends uh, you are not the person that I'm I'm gunning for here. So I just I, I was just I, I didn't mean to come across as insecure. I was just trying to preclude any gotchas from uh, <laughs> down the road, right? Like I'm fully aware of, of of you know who is who I am, you know, participating in this conversation. Um, but uh, oh, we got a question for you here, Jordan. Just popped in. Uh, Corey asks, uh, can you elaborate more on what you mean by the anxiety of influence? Um, yeah. Um, so um definitely um i i have no problem with influence and i have no problem with authors working inside of a tradition i agree with harold bloom in his seminal book the anxiety of influence and he's talking about shakespeare in that book that it's not only difficult but it, in some sense it's unavoidable it's it's impossible for us to escape from the grip that shakespeare has on us which makes sense if you agree with Bloom, uh, Harold Bloom, the, the great uh, literary critic who just passed away last year. He actually wrote a book called Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, where he basically argues that Shakespeare invented our modern condition. He invented modernity. But I would. And so I agree that there's this idea that we're always struggling to escape from the from the stranglehold that our 
greatest influence has on us. And of course, Harold Loom is talking about the fact that Shakespeare invented modernity and we just can't seem to, I mean, think about Macbeth, like existentialism wouldn't exist without Macbeth. Postmodernism wouldn't exist without Hamlet. And so, but, but my point is, is I would at least like to see authors try, um, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is um, when you have someone like Tolkien, for example, when you drop a stone into a pond, you get these ripples outward. And for, and the first one, the first ripple might be a big one and it might be exciting, but eventually they get smaller and they're smaller and they're smaller and they're smaller because the wave that came before was smaller. And so you see this now where young writers are saying that their influence, their inspiration is Pat Rothfuss. And Pat Rothfuss says his big inspirations are uh, Peter S. Beagle and Anne McCaffrey and C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. And so it's like, okay, that's great. But do you know who Tolkien's influences were, right? And so my point is that I would like to see authors try to drop a new stone in the water. And that doesn't mean you have to abandon tradition. I am obviously uh, a opposed to all attempts to kind of French revolutionary style start the calendar over at zero. It doesn't mean you have to be ex obsessed with experimentation or stylistic eccentricities or that you try to be different for the sake of being different, but that you try to get back. I'm saying the opposite, that you try to go back to the original source material uh, to try for ourselves to dig up the roots of our shared past. And I feel like a lot of authors are it, it, it's like these studies that they do that show that, uh, for example, Gen Z kids, uh, I read a study about how of all generations, Gen Z, uh, young Gen Z uh, Zoomers, for example, are the most caught up in their own generation, the most ignorant of generations past. So, for example, when I was growing up, I was I had to sit in the backseat of my car and there was no iPad. There was no iPhone. There was no television on the back on the back of my parents seat. And so I couldn't watch Disney movies or escape into my social media or my own music. I had to sit there compliantly in the back seat and listen to my mom who would play Led Zeppelin on the radio. And my dad would play doo-wop music and oldies. And so I grew up and I can, I, I have memorized every lyric from the seventies and from the fifties of like every song that's ever been, because I spent so much time in the car with my parents and my little brother uh, I, I'm in a family where my little brother is much younger than me. He's like 12 years younger than me. And he doesn't know any of that stuff because he was raised, he's a digital native. He was raised in a generation in which uh, he had the privilege to sit in the back seat and just do his own thing. And he never learned about my parents' favorite 80s movies or their favorite music. And I'm just seeing this kind of cut off sense of disconnection with the past. It reminds me of... I'm sorry to get really obscure and I know I'm rambling, but I, I'll say one more thing. It kind of reminds me of Wordsworth's um, poem, The World is Too Much With Us. And uh, and in that poem, the speaker basically says, and I, I'm going to butcher the, uh, the, the poem here. He says, the world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers, little we see in nature that is ours. And he's talking about how out of touch we are with the natural world. And in some sense, out of touch with the things that are most essential in life. And at the end of the poem, I don't remember the middle of the poem, but at the end he says, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn so that I might witness, so I'm butchering it, Proteus rising from the sea or so that I could hear Triton blow his wreathed horn. And the, and the point that I'm making is that we've lost something really important. There's a sense in which we're almost trapped in modernity and that for some reason we can't seem to get back to what matters and in this poem, when this guy looks out at the sea, he just feels his own modern existential angst. He doesn't see the gods of old. That aspect, I would say, of the human condition is totally lost to us now, and we're never going to get it back. And it's actually the same point that Richard Weaver makes in his book, Ideas Have Consequences. When, but in, in, in that book, he's talking about William of Ockham and nominalism in the late Middle Ages. But my point is that I would like to see an attempt on the part of modern fantasy authors to not only read Tolkien, but to go back and immerse themselves, get off social media and read like um, Canterbury Tales and read like Sir, Sir Gawain. I, 
I'm rambling, so you guys can yeah. just. It, it's, it's interesting you say that because I uh, I can't remember why I was reading newspaper clippings from like the 20s, and they and there was one article I think it was about I think it was about uh, 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 upheavals in China at the time, right? And the newspaper article was making a bunch of allusions to Homer, and I like. I, I thought about the, you know, just read another book meme with regard to journalists and Harry Potter. And I was like, oh, they used to, right? Uh, and it, it's just interesting to look, right? Like a hundred years ago, you could read uh, a regular old newspaper and find uh, people who would reference, right? Uh, who would reference the Iliad, who would reference the Odyssey, uh, you know, who could tell you every detail of Caractacus's uniform. And people don't know who Caractacus is anymore, right? Like... No, our uh, intellectuals are citing Hunger Games. They're not citing the decline of the Roman Empire. Right. Uh, although you shouldn't. You shouldn't cite Gibbon because Gibbon is, 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 uh, is a <laughs> No, I didn't say the decline oh. of all of the Roman Empire. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, so it's it's just interesting because I do think I do think the well uh, hasn't dried up. I think I think someone's like blocked it um, for well, for most people. They don't even know. Uh, you know, you, you, you could talk to a person on the street and they've never heard of, of, of Genghis Khan, right? <laughs> like, which is astonishing to me. I'm like, he's kind of important, right? Like, uh, you never, you never know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, wait, my turn. Hold on. Yeah, I guess it's your turn. Yeah. The problem with this format is you guys go back and forth and then there's like 20 things they have to respond to and I'm going to like get to two. So that's okay. Uh, one, Edmund Burke. Awesome. Also Dick Weaver. Awesome. Um, did not Dave, I'm sorry. so uh two uh Lord Dunsany awesome over in the over in the scroll. Um it's fantastic that no one would publish his gods of Pagana, so he went out and self-published it and then never had to self-publish anything thereafter, right? And this is in what like 1910 or something. Um absolutely fantastic. So, like on on the point of uh modern influences. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. I, I think that storytelling has moved into more and more accessible formats, movies, MTV, video games. And I think it is mostly, not maybe entirely, but it has mostly become very, very glib, right? And and uh, and to respond to a very early comment that, that Num de Plume made, but maybe that's Nome de Plume, I don't know. Uh, in 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 the scroll, he said, "Hey, you know, um, uh, a book could still say something meaningful or interesting and be, you know, grim, dark, or or uh, or hard magic." And that is certainly true. My experience, though, is that it's rare. It's more rare, right? So, so my brother and I'm going to like I'm going to for Sanderson again. So, my brother like really wanted me to read The Way of Kings, the first Stormlight Archive book. So he bought me this four hundred thousand word book, right? I read the whole thing. Um, and there, there are various reasons I didn't like it. But one of my sort of uh, frustrations was there's this character, Kaladin. And Kaladin is a prisoner. And then he goes and he is in like this, this unit. They're like a bridge team, right? And there's a war uh, where every once in a while, all hell breaks loose on this crack plane. And they run out and try and set up their bridge. And there's this really lengthy... Uh, leadership parable in which uh, Kaladin learns to become a leader and he tells us what it takes to be a leader. And what does it take to be a leader? Well, you have to be willing to do the same things as the people on your team. And I read that and I thought, were you 12 when you learned that? Right? Or or could you learn that when you were eight? Uh, it's, the, it's the most ridiculously watered down anodyne corporate trainer kind of nonsense insight right now then if you compare that to something like the book of judges and read the story of samuel and you go or or of sorry of uh, samson and what the hell right like is he a good guy i don't know right there's something cosmic about him he's like the terrifying justice of yahweh uh and, and in fact so literally cosmic that uh uh, Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Decken suggest, I think, that he is a, a mythology, mythologization of the movements of the planet Mars, right? Because So I, I, I think a person could write a deep book eating kind of pablum, but I think it's just hard. It's just not likely. And, and that's a problem. 
Oop, did we lose you, Dave? I'm, I think I'm not supposed to go back, Leo. At the point. <laughs> you there? Uh, no, we lost you for a sec, Dave. I think you're back now. Um, yep. Well, no, no, don't, don't hold. Oh, back. sorry. Uh, Which if, part? If, you you know, if only for Liam's <laughs> sake. I think he's having a blast. Uh, good old, good old Liam. Uh, who also, uh, I agree. You should read. You should read, Sir Dwayne. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, they said Sanderson is ddosing you. Uh, let's see. Uh, another good question from Corey. As a uh, follow up on the concept of being trapped in modernity, do you think the trend of having characters be basically 21st century metropolitans in a medieval fantasy world is this 100%? Oh my gosh. I watched, I was recovering, I had a surgery in December and I watched the second season of The Witcher, which I generally like. The production is, 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 is fun. I like Henry Cavill. Uh, I really like Joey Beatty because I like his band. Thank you, Orion, if you're still here uh awesome but uh man the dialogue was just like i was at a starbucks the whole time and and it bothers me because one of the things that one of my my beta readers told me early on was that my characters were were cursing uh, my character's curses were meaningless because uh because hadrian didn't believe in the things he was swearing by and uh that was like the best bit of feedback i have ever gotten from anybody and I've thought about that ever since, right? Because uh, because curses should mean something. This is something you see, like uh, you you see with fantasy, right? Like it's uh, like people don't think about you know the sorts of curses, for example, that people should be using in this setting, right? They usually will keep the the scatological, right, and the other you know, like body curses, uh, which weren't even really a thing in the middle ages to begin with that came along later because the victorians were so were so prissy uh you know so like not only is that like a a feature that doesn't feel appropriately medieval in the setting right but it is also uh like it, like it just shows that is another way that the writer hasn't thought about the setting right in, in any serious way because people when they do their world building they think about maps right they think about what monsters are where and where the desert is and things like that but they don't they don't think about um the deeper things and you should really start there you should start with language right or you should start with religion uh and and language is hard right like i'm not saying that you need to go in and like make up um you know uh elvish right it was like that's difficult but i i remember working on a fantasy story and i was gonna have a crusades and then i remember the word crusade means there's a cross involved right and so like you can't say crusade if there's no cross right and you need to think about that sort of language and and a lot of stuff that gets made right all the way down to the dialogue level of the characters right uh it being pseudo 1300 and them saying you know the f word uh you know uh is is so um it, it's sort of like they're telling on themselves right they haven't thought about this with the appropriate seriousness so we get back to the glibness dave or, or uh you know jordan your point about how all of this should be taken more seriously right um or less like just be funny if you're trying to be funny but like everything ends up and i think this is a generational thing because as a millennial i think millennials are fundamentally insincere as like a species like we just can't be honest uh you know uh, part of that is like being afraid to hurt anybody's feelings part of that is feeling ashamed of your own feelings right but like nobody can do like the reason hadrian is a recurring joke where people call him dramatic is if i just had done that outright everyone would hate the book like i have to make fun of it uh or people uh wouldn't believe it was sincere and i i think that's all um that's all a feature of that sort of um 21st century -ness. Right, and I, uh, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've rambled down myself. So. Yeah, Christopher, this is what you're talking about. Is what David Foster Wallace was trying to tackle with his. I mean, you, you guys can all Google this, or you know, find the Wikipedia article about it. But he was, he was trying to start something that he called the New Sincerity Movement, because he was realizing how ironic our modern culture was, and he, he did a, uh, he did a commencement speech at Kenyon College, which is actually happens to be where my uncle uh, graduated. And uh, the speech was is now published as a book and it's called This is Water. Um, and, and he's and he's talking about how uh, how we are very uncomfortable these days with being sincere and being earnest. 
uh, and saying what we mean. And we have to, we have to, and I think this gives rise to some degree to meme culture. Uh, everything has to be wrapped in kind of irony. Uh, the, the example that Foster Wallace uses in brief, what's the book called? Brief Interviews with Hideous Men. Uh, actually, John Krasinski turned that into a movie. Uh, the example he uses is when you are in the bathroom and you're looking in the mirror and you're you know, adjusting your hair or you're just making sure you look presentable, someone walks in and you you jump back and you're super like self-conscious about the fact that you're adjusting your appearance. And he talks about the fact that that's a kind of, um, you know, it's a kind of uh, reverse uh, narcissism. It's a kind of, um, and, and so I think, I think you're talking about kind of the, the, the irony of the modern age. And I also, Christopher, just, this is not even related. I wanted to touch on the fact that you, you, you mentioned crusade, and I, I wonder if you could speak to why the new F Dune films had to make it cru cru Crusade versus Jihad. I I think that um, I, I I think there are two possibilities Fear. there. I, either they were afraid of hurting someone's feelings, uh, and they weren't afraid of hurting some other people's feelings, or they were ashamed of the source material to some degree. Right. Uh, and and in both cases, I think that's a shame because I think if art is cowardly, it shouldn't exist. Uh, and that was my like, if I have a serious critique of my movie, it, it's it's that it did it did that. Right. Which is maybe a trite thing. Right. Because like art must uh, be courageous because it, it must be true. Right. Uh, you know, even if only in that symbolic sense. Right. Um, and so whenever I, I like you can tell when a, a when a storyteller is pulling their punches in the text right or on the page or on the screen or wherever right um and that's and that's concerning right because and, and it's also an indictment of the people that you think might get you know might get upset with you right like and that's not very kind or or, or adult even right um you know, but it, it's also, it's an indictment to Frank Herbert. They're like, maybe he shouldn't have written it this way. And I think that that's troubling. Uh, I don't like it in, in any in any case. I do like the movie on balance. I think it's Me as too. faithful an adaptation as I've ever seen. But I, I do think that's part of it. I, I, I wanted to say too, and this sort of is wrapped up in it, that a weird consequence of the the irony and the insincerity of, of modern culture is that everyone thinks jokes are serious which is so weird, right? Uh, you know, you're talking about memes, right? Like everybody thinks like a meme is some sort of like secret signal, uh, you know, that like, <laughs> that like it's not a joke, right? You're like, oh my gosh, this person uh, made fun of somebody. They must actually hate them, uh, which, is, um, which is another one. So there's an interesting question here, which I should say too, by the way, folks, if you do want to ask questions, I know we've been kind of ignoring the chat for the first hour here, we should uh, we we should take some questions, you know, here uh, as we as we move into this. I can't see time. the chat, just to let you know. No worries. Uh, can you see what's going on the screen now? Uh, non diplom perhaps uh, asked. Do you think uh, part of the problem uh, is oh, within the lines of publishing as well, where editors are requiring certain commentaries or causing writers to simplify and not get as honest as they want to? Uh, selecting points of view because they simply find it more enjoyable to read a point of view that's agreeable to their own, I think 100%. Yeah, I, I, I think that's I think that's a bit right. I, I don't think it's like people tend to think that a lot of, of, of that stuff, right, especially in terms of maybe political uh, commentary and things like that has to do with like a like a secret plan, like there's a cabal of, 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 of sorcerers up in New York who's plotting to make the books all come out a certain way. And, it, and that's not true, right? It's 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 just, I like this kind of story because it makes me happy and it's my job to read all of these books all of the time, right? So they may as well be, you know, pleasant to me. And, uh, you know, maybe the problem is that there is not enough, uh, uh, and I use this word uh, cautiously, uh, diversity on the uh, editing teams, right? Maybe that's part of the problem, but, um, but I do, I do think that the, the the nature of gatekeeping, right, in in publishing such as it is, uh, you know, is is as in anything, right? It's a selection mechanism, and uh, we sort of, you know, narrow. Uh, we keep narrowing the gates because we're trying to keep the quality high, but 
when the selection mechanism is no longer selecting for quality, it's selecting for the comfort of um, the editorial staff, right? Because they have, you know, stressful jobs and they are generally underpaid, right? Uh, you know, they need to compensate for well, that. Well, I think they would also say, making their life easier. I, I oh, think sorry, they would also say, oh, I am picking books that are important truth tellers. Now, that's true, too. Um, I think that's mostly bullshit. bullshit. Uh, uh, yeah, because I think I think they're fostering a monoculture. But I think I think they an editor might sincerely think I am picking people who are telling brave truths. It happens to be the same truths. They happen to be shallow political points. Well, often truth, uh, you know, to people, truth means uh, whatever's in the mirror, right? Uh, you know, it should be like me. It should not challenge me. Uh, you know, it should look like me. It should be familiar, right? Uh, and, and that's, I mean, that's not, that's not what truth is because a lot of us, all of us are bent in some way, right? And so the reflection is not a really good compass. And I find that there's a lot of that in, uh, uh, in, 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 in these things too. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of inward, uh, gazing in a lot of modern fantasy as well. It's often a platform for people airing their, uh, you know, their grievances or their dysfunctions. And those things are important, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of difficulty in the world, right? And it's not to say that people's internal issues aren't important, but, uh, you know, there is, there's still something higher, there's still something more, I think that's important, right? Uh, and so, um, I think that's an interesting observation about what people perceive to be true. And I think it ties to an observation I wanted to make. I think one of the reasons why for fantasy characters, point of view or otherwise, often feel so modern is writers not only uh, can't see beyond the gulf between themselves and a pre-modern or archaic person, they don't even know there's a gulf. And I think those gulfs are enormous. Uh, just to take maybe a couple dumb examples, right? The night sky. The night sky. Your average sci-fi fantasy writer has seen it maybe a few times, right? Some of them living in New York, maybe never. But but the ancients, right up until right up until gas lighting. So I don't know what that is. Right up until eighteen hundred and some, right? Everyone saw the night sky all the time, and it was profoundly meaningful because you used it to navigate, uh, not just north, south, east, and west. You used it to uh, people used it to move seasonally constellations would rise and they would know it's time for us to move to the other you know pastoral ground or the hunting that ground. that dave was that was my point with the wordsworth poem that was my yeah. entire point very yep. good yeah and and there are so many other examples the idea of the great chain of being that god is the most existing one and that we participate in godness to different degrees depending how close we are in that chain of, of of necessarily existing versus contingently existing i think you say that it as uh, the average science fiction convention people are going to go what are you what right the um, great chain of who now yeah they just have no idea what they don't know uh and i think it's a matter of looking up on wikipedia to figure out you know how many miles an hour does a does a, a trireme go right and that's just not that's not it at all. I love that there's someone here in the comments that whose username is Aspiring Gold Soul. Uh, that is someone who has read Plato's Republic. Thank you very much. When the, <laughs> culture, the awesome. when the culture is saturated with an end of history mindset, heroes become impossible. That is so true. This is why Rocchio's futuristic setting is perfect to remind us we always need heroes. Uh, that is awesome, dude. Uh, aspiring gold soul. Yeah, this is why a lot of people bag on Ayn Rand. And I know you, D, uh, Dave, uh, just from getting to know you a little bit here. Uh, and you, Christopher, from getting to know you uh, for quite a while now. I know you're not the biggest uh, Ayn Rand fans. But uh, the th one of the things I do like about her, okay, is that she does give us heroes. They may be heroes that certain people find unpalatable or that uh, are not worthy heroes or something like that, whatever the, the opinion may be, she unabashedly gives us a hero. Um, and I, I totally agree with uh, aspiring gold soul uh, there. 
that uh, the uh, guardian class there that uh, in a culture saturated with an end of history mindset, heroes are impossible. I think that's true. Yeah. I like oh. what William Henning is saying here. Uh, it's nice people should be able to get their truths out too. Look, I, um, I not to backpedal, but to sort of put in context things I've been saying. Um, I am a free speech zealot. Uh, everyone should be able to talk. Uh, like the only reason why speech is restricted is if you're committing criminal conspiracies or libel, right? Uh, everyone should be able to tell stories. Um, I also believe in value and quality and meaning. So I find some stories uh, meaningless or harmful, right? Uh, but I certainly wouldn't, if I were the czar of stories, that doesn't mean that I would say, oh, you can't say your story. It means you can say your story and I'm going to tell you that it's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I also I, I also want to say something that we I don't think we've touched on yet because we asked this question at the beginning and then we're both we're all you know ranting about our sort of inner feelings about the genre as a whole. But I also think one of the things I want to just say in general that fantasy that modern fantasy hasn't done a I guess speculative fiction hasn't done a good enough job with is um look, I love hard science fiction. I absolutely love it. Alistair Reynolds, Peter F. Hamilton, Ian M. Banks, inject that stuff into my veins. But if it's going to be merely about predicting where technology is going to be in 600 years or describing the light hugger drives that we'll have in <laughs> 10,000 years, then I'm not interested. And the same goes for me for fantasy. And this goes back to what we were talking about. You, Dave, were talking about Brandon Sanderson. Uh, and I kind of like agree with all of your takes about Brandon Sanderson. I love me an interesting magic system. It's great. Brandon Sanderson. I'm reading James Islington right now. Pat Rothfuss, uh, Brent Weeks. These guys do have some innovative and cool magic systems. They really do. But if it's going to be merely about the world building and the inner mechanics of the magic system, and if it begins to feel like I'm reading a manual versus a story, then I'm not interested. Um, and it kind of, so that, 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 that's one thing that I felt like I left out earlier when I was describing like what I think is missing. Um, and it was, it was actually, it was that same Lloyd Alexander essay where he said, one of the things that we have to ask in fantasy is how shall we live as human beings? It's that kind of Socratic question. Uh, and it's interesting because Cormac McCarthy, who I think is one of the greatest uh, living writers, he says, if it doesn't, I'm probably butchering the quote again, if it doesn't concern life or death, I'm not interested in it. It's not interesting to me. And I agree with that. I don't like the sterile, the, kind of cold, lifeless feel. And, and you and I, Dave, were just talking about this uh, like yesterday via email, the sense in which sci-fi, especially space opera, uh, can feel sterile, can feel rootless and and cold. The, 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 and Christopher, I know you have something to say about this, and I'd love to hear what you have to say. I feel like the characters in space opera, and I feel like this excludes you, if they're not single, they're usually enmeshed in these transactional relationships. And they're always, right, they're always something punk, right? They're either corrupt plutocratic elites or they're they're oppressed belters or miners or like they're the ultras in Revelation space or the extras in, in Sun Eater. They're augmented, modified, and they're always on some long journey to figure out some puzzle or problem. They're freezing themselves and losing all of their relationships so they can be alive 50 years later when the next task uh, has to be completed so they can see the future. But my question is why, why? And I think that's, I think that's one of the great distinctions between fantasy and sci-fi that we've seen. And I think Christopher, your books bridge that there's this great um, book by the journalist, the uh, British journalist, David Goodhart, called The Road to Somewhere. And the book is kind of trying to analyze where we're at right now in terms of the sociopolitical landscape. And good, good, Goodhart makes this distinction between cosmopolitan anywhere vote, uh, voters, people, mm -hmm. and they're more, more sort of localist, uh, sort of localist, nationalist somewhere. Right. Uh, 
Yeah. counterparts yeah and he makes the argument that our elites the people who are having the best time of things right now who are ruling who are governing things they have a mobile soul they can thrive anywhere they've achieved this kind of portable identity uh, learn to code right and they all learn to code and these are the anywhere people and their educations have equipped them with the knowledge they, no matter what the market does, they can survive because they have these portable skills. They can move to any city. No matter what, they're going to be okay. And then, of course, uh, Goodhart talks about there are those who are not part of the educated ruling class. The people, these are the people who value home. They value tradition. They value stability, generational continuity, memory. These are the people who are tied to place, to nation, to home. And it has occurred to me that sci-fi and space opera is always painting this portrait of the anywhere people with the of the mobile souls whereas fantasy fantasy introduces you to the somewhere people and that is one of the things that i think is essential about fantasy these are the people who value home who value the shire who value um where they are and the history of the land that they inhabit and so i wanted to know if you guys could maybe speak to that yeah so i mean uh, this is why I don't really like Star Trek, right? Which gets me in a lot of trouble everywhere I go. Uh, I assume that I was like executed before the Federation, like like went on you know their five year <laughs> journeys, because I don't recognize like myself in any of those characters at all. Uh, you know, I I just I, I don't I don't get it, right? Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> and I guess maybe not, right? Like, why would someone who like barely leaves his house, you know, be on a starship? But uh, you know, like, but they don't feel like people to me, right? They, they, and, and this is the thing, right? You'll you'll see in, in uh, although apparently Picard, they've forgotten that um, that they don't need psychologists anymore because they eradicated mental illness. But uh, you know, the the lore masters are not keeping their books very very well. Uh, but they've eradicated mental illness, right? Uh, they've eradicated like a lot of the the things that make people people, and and what's left is I don't know like some strange you know uh, bloodless utopian vision, uh, which of course they're dismantling pretty rapidly with the new stuff anyway. But like the um, uh, Severian, I don't really much like any of it to be honest. Uh, I don't I I just don't see those characters as human, right? Uh, there's something missing in them. And this is something, um, uh, there's just something that's that's missing in, in all of it, all the way back to Roddenberry for me. Uh, and, and there's a lot of science fiction that's like that. that and, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, someone is trying to call me. It's uh, interesting, Jordan, there's, I, I wonder if some of the anxiousness to assign weight to identities that are purely sexual comes from a lack of sense of other identities right there's no sense of you know who you're where you're from or who your people are um i think the white collar class in america has been systematically abandoning any notion of a, of religion right i'm spiritual but not religious i think is the right is the shibboleth um right and I wonder if uh, that's not good for humans. And I wonder if this is why it's so urgent or if this is a factor in why it's so urgent to assign everybody a, a check the box based on apparent ethnicity and sexual preferences. Yeah, I think to some degree, Dave, the observation you're making goes back to the distinction in Western culture that I've written about in the past between uh, mimetic and poetic identity. Uh, Mimetic is the idea that there is an external reality, that there's an objective external reality outside of you, and it places demands on you. You are hylomorphic. You are you are not just uh, matter. You're not just uh, flesh, nor are you just this kind of Gnostic floating self. You are the, the, as Christopher put it in my conversation with him, you are the conversation between matter and spirit. Uh, this goes back to obviously uh, Christianity, but also Aristotle, uh, and uh, and I think that there was a certain point. I think it begins kind of with Rousseau uh, in the Romantic period, where we shift from a 
mimetic point of view in which you have to conform to the outside world, which places demands on you. You have certain roles that you have to fulfill. You have to conform to institutions. Uh, and the poetic view is the idea that your inner authenticity is that what should govern everything. And you should, uh, the external world and our institutions should conform themselves to you. And so, of course, this, this is what you get in the politics of recognition, the idea that the external world's job is to conform to you and institutions should mold themselves to you. And I think that that is a staple uh, I think that's a staple of modernity. And I think that you see that come into fruition with Nietzsche, who tells everyone that they can be these sort of um, these value determining gods and existentialism tells tells us that you can just create your own meaning. Uh, and there is no given meaning that you have to discover. Life is not about um finding yourself. It's about creating yourself and you get to become this sort of, and which is obviously this is at the heart of Dostoevsky's crime and punishment. The idea that Raskolnikov believes he can just sort of make himself uh, and that he can just choose uh, and create his own morality. Uh, and he realizes eventually, of course, uh, from a prostitute, which is a very kind of Christian message that this is uh, an error. This is an error. This is the wrong way to think about things. Uh, and, and so I think, yeah, this is a pretty old idea, uh, yeah. but I think it goes back to the romantic. What do, you, what do you think about that, Dave? Is that ridiculous? No, no. And I think, I think actually I would have posited, I would have put that as one of the distinctions between a modern and ancient mind. I think, I think anciently, you know, you read the wisdom literature of the Egyptians or the Hebrews or whoever, and it all has to do with, look, here's, here's the way the world is. If you understand the way the world is, you can shape your life to the way the world is and you can live a better life and so can your family right that's what wisdom the, the well there's two kinds of wisdom literature but the non-revelatory book of daniel stuff like the the, the proverbs or uh right or even cognitive uh, modern cognitive behavioral therapy is about adjusting right. the, the term well adjusted means that you are fallen you are imperfect the world is a certain way there are certain external facts and you have to conform yourselves yourself to them uh, versus the world having to conform itself to you, which we, we couldn't run a civilization that way. I, I do wonder how much of this is a consequence of uh, how good we've had it, right? Uh, you know, the last couple of years were sort of a warning shot across everyone's bow that like the world and history are still out there snarling and sharpening their fangs. But uh, like, like we've been in this sort of like, like Eloy garden, right? Like my entire life, like history was effectively on pause. And, and so in that sort of vacuum, I think um, people were sort of, you know, free to do kind of whatever they wanted because the world wasn't punching them in the kidneys every single day. And, uh, and, and as that seems to be changing and the gears of history are turning, I wonder if, I wonder if these things won't just, um, won't just change, um, uh, you know, if people uh, will, will grow up, will wake up. I think that might be true. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Uh, William Henning says, uh, oh, I'm reading. Yeah, I'm reading chat. Yeah, you're reading uh, chat. Sunny Dear has been my favorite new series this last decade, along with Red Rising. Um, your books have kept me uh, reading fiction. Oh, well, we, thanks, we man. thanks for being here. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the uh, coming on the stream. There was a question up above. I, uh, I we missed it. several questions. So one question was, I think Liam asked. There was a question about. Uh, a couple of questions about writing, uh, like discovery was one of them. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. What do you uh, think is a good fantasy novel? Yeah, I found here's the first one. Uh, I think that we missed. Uh, Corey, as a writer, have become more appreciative of style and voice, and have lamented the lack of stylistic excellence in modern fantasy, with a few notable exceptions. Uh, where do you think that comes from? I have a theory, but uh, you guys first. Uh. That's an interesting question. A degraded education. <laughs> that was my answer. Um, oh, interesting. <laughs> rhetoric yeah. used to be one of the fundamental subjects, right? And now you might get it in college. Uh, it's like usually if I like open the like can of silly worms, like writing advice is go learn some rhetoric, right? Like go go pick up a style guide and and, and practice that. Um, yeah. Uh, I think actually, Dave, I think BYU has a web page I've mentioned a hundred times called Silver Rhetorica that like catalogs all the old rhetorical like tropes, right? The actual tropes, right? Not the not the TV ones. 
Uh, and I, uh, for one of my classes I was made to do is like a reflection exercise, right? Like five of each one a day over the course of the semester and turn in a stack of, of, uh, of, of practice. And that was kind of like what you did in like the 1600s, right? Was you like did this commonplace book practice and people don't do that anymore. Like nobody knows what rhetoric is. They think it's just like sorcery. You hear it on the news. It's like, oh, politician X used some rhetoric against his opponent. And I'm like, did he also throw a lightning bolt? Like, I am, <laughs> you know, like, like <laughs> no one knows what it means. Um, but I, I think that people just aren't schooled in grammar and rhetorical style at all like they used to be. I actually think school is, is in serious decline, just on the basis of what my children study. I think they read less. Uh, they write less. Um, they're they're exposed to. Uh, uh, I don't have any sense. This is a secondhand coming through them, but I don't have any sense of a exposure to an idea of a civilization and a continuity of civilization uh, and, and and literature. So, I, yeah, I think I think education's in decline. Yeah, I think one thing I would say as well, I'm not sure. Let me scroll down. Who wrote I don't this? mean to pick on you, Jordan, you being a teacher. Um, it also yeah, well, may be, right, that yes, it, uh, the education of the consuming market being in decline changes yes. what people write. Yes. And yes, so I want to say that that observation, uh, when I think about it, I I do teach an AP language course. We do study classical rhetoric. We also study kind of more modern rhetoric, Rogerian argument, things like that. But we do study classical rhetoric. And uh, I do think it has to do, I think I do think it's a question of education. And I just pulled this up right now because I obviously don't have the entire essay memorized, but um, Orwell writes, his most famous essay is called Politics in the English Language. And the essay is about the way in which our language has become degraded, which has made it easier for tyrants to uh, we all kind of pull the wool over our eyes. And at, at a certain point, and this is to your point, Dave and Christopher, Orwell says now that and Orwell walks us through all these different, uh, these different meaningless words and pretentious diction and these uh, operators and verbal, verbal false limbs, dying metaphors and things like that. And eventually he gets to this point where he says, now that I've made a catalog of swindles and perversions, let me give another kind of uh, example of the kind of writing that they lead to. This time it must of its own nature be an imaginary one. Orwell says, I'm going to translate a passage of good English into modern English of the worst sort. Here, he says, is a well-known verse from Ecclesiastes. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. And he says, here it is in modern English. Objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compels the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with any capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must be in invariably be taken into account. And he says, this is a parody, but not a very gross one. And uh, he, he's talking about the fact that we are, you know, kind of the old school, like 19th century mode of teaching where we ask students to sit up straight and uh, read the Bible and me actually memorize long passages that is degrade, that is derided and that is scorned. Uh, but I feel like that has a lot to do with the decline of, of our language. Um, uh, students just don't know what, what uh, good English sounds like. Oh, Corey, have you read Carl Truman's The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self? Yeah, I wrote an article about it as well. And uh, I did read that. And I was inspired enough. Yes, exactly. So you've read it too, Corey. That's awesome. Uh, yes, Funny. that's what it's I was recently talking about. recommended to me, actually, as it happens. Yeah. Cool. Um, we got another question here from Liam. Uh, so what are some of the greatest fantasy stories, if we're talking about what makes it great? That is an excellent question. Obviously, Lord of the Rings, we talked about it ad nauseum, so we can kind of set that one aside. But uh, what about you guys? Here's one I really like recently, uh, recently-ish. Oh, I'm old. It's like 17 years or something. So um, the uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Uh, oh, yeah. Susanna Clark. Susanna Clark? Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to get the sequel because I think she's dealing with... Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and oh. so i think it's a one but but it's a book that has an ending um although clearly there it, it was intended to be more um if you haven't read it the book is 
profoundly, obsessively, deeply English. It is all about England. And it, and it presents historical points of view that are England, but not the England that you are thinking, England, Northern England. It's an England which uh, had magic uh, and, the, and the magic is intrinsically and authentically English. So this whole question about whether we can trust fairies to bring us our magic. If you go back and look in, in the records uh, of the of, of British uh, cunning folk, right? Uh, there's this idea that they had familiar spirits who they worked with. But what's never clear is who the familiar spirits are, because sometimes they seem to be the spirit of the dead, but sometimes the same spirits seem to be fairies, and sometimes they're angels, right? And so there are these people who go to trial talking sincerely about how there's, you know, Tom, who or what is Tom? Well, I don't know. He's my familiar spirit who, who teaches me how to do these things, right? So Susanna Clark is, is really rooted in real magic of her island, arguing kind of about how should we see the history of this island? Should we have this London-centric, Shakespeare-driven, Tudor-centric view of England? Or is there a view of the island that is centered around, say, York, which is the natural geographic center, right? Um, and gets into thematic questions like, what is an Englishman? Stephen Black, who, who, is, uh, who was born on a slave ship, a black man, brought to England so he's free, right? He's very English in his manners. Does, does that make him English? Can, is he or can he become, you know, an Englishman? It's, it's, it's uh, just very thematically consistent. Um, stylistically, on the first read, I would have said, man, A, great imitation of Jane Austen. I read it now like three times, and I kind of, after a few reads, you kind of go, all right, the mask slips off here and there. But still, it's, it's basically a Jane Austen-esque, uh, I don't know, six, 700-page uh, fantasy about Englishness about Englishness. I, I think that's a wonderful recent-ish book. I'm going to I'm going to say uh just responding to that same question. This is going to make me sound very kind of obsequious uh to Christopher, very sycophantic. Oh no. I'm, I'm I am more speakers. No, no. I have to say this. So I think that if I'm going to say who is doing it right in fantasy. And I know Christopher sees his work as, um, as sword and planet as kind of um, science fantasy and things like that. I think that, uh, and again, I know this, this is awkward because the, the author is sitting right here, but I think you couldn't do better than um, the sun eater series. I think speculative fiction suffers from a, from a major problem, which is that it's fans talk about fantasy and sci-fi stories almost entirely with respect to the characters and plots. You rarely hear a fantasy and sci-fi fan discuss philosophical implications, deep themes, underlying motifs or symbols. Or and what's interesting is that this isn't the case with classic literature. Um, and I'm not saying none of these modern fantasy or sci-fi novels do this. I'm saying that when you participate in these discord discussions or when you watch a booktuber review a fantasy novel, they talk about the plot and how excited they are that this happened and then this happened and then this happened and how giddy and excited they are to find out what happens next. And you hear them talk about characters and magic and world building. And sometimes you'll hear them say, oh, well, I read this Tad Williams novel and the prose was great, but you rarely hear deeper discussions about how what does the it books have to say right how exactly how does this novel speak to the human condition what does this novel have to say about the way in which we live today what are the deep human truths and universal themes and ideas that the author is is playing with and what are the different moral visions at play and how do they conflict and don't get me wrong i have I'm not trying to be a snob or an elitist here. Trust me, I I yeah. like a good Bane story. I like a good whiz bang military sci-fi novel. I'm the guy who has read book uh, who has who has read and reviewed books on my channel, like Jack Campbell, uh, his his Lost Fleet series, and John Grisham's The Firm, and things like that. My point is that we aren't 
t- taking fantasy and sci-fi again to return to this theme we're not taking it seriously enough the real snob says that fantasy and sci-fi uh isn't worth reading it isn't real literature fantasy and sci-fi guys you would both agree with this fantasy and sci-fi have struggled to be taken seriously for the past 150 years uh or so and i'm not i told you how i feel about that at the beginning right i think those people have their you know their shoes on their head uh i i don't think that a lot of realistic fiction is that right like it's even more ridiculous and abstract and removed from uh ordinary life right Um, yeah i i think that the sort of symbolic nature of of both fantasy and science fiction we could talk about science fiction to an extent too right because it's it's kind of it, it's just fantasy, but it's got some like different, it's got a slightly different orientation, right? But the spirit underneath is kind of the same. It's doing the same thing. Right. And, um, but like that's so much more real, right? Than uh, some, some dry minimalist novel could ever hope to be, uh, you know? And, and so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Which is why I actually like, I know this is going to be controversial among you and Dave probably, but I actually liked the new wave movement writers like JG Ballard and Samuel Delaney and Brian Aldiss and Octavia Butler and Ursula Le Guin. I like the bunch of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh, you do. You would obviously. Yeah. And I just, I I, I would, I would throw a few of them away, but you know, that's true of any group of, uh, of artists. Yeah. Joanna Roos, we could toss her out. That's both of the Shelley's. (laughs) Um, but i just feel like the new wave wasn't just a bunch of hipsters hipster writers trying to be edgy and avant-garde it was a reaction against genre exhaustion it was a reaction against the staleness of of campbell sci-fi yeah 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 Yeah. campbell is campbell 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 shrunk science fiction until it fit on the head of a pin Right. Uh, I know. If you like that one little grain of, of hydrogen that he had left, I right? know. Be cool. But like, and I you know. know, you don't want to read about engineer heroes solving sterile logic puzzles. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're out in the cold, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I totally get it. I'm not a Campbellian by any means. Uh, yeah. And, and again, I like golden age sci fi, I like weird tales and pulpy sword and sorcery. But I also think that the new wave writers of the 60s and 70s, and to some degree, the 80s revitalized the genre so that by the time we get to the 90s, we have a kind of union, we have a golden age revival that brings together the literary sensibilities, the irony, the thoughtfulness that we talked about the stylistic experimentation of modernism but then it combines that with the kind of ethos and the and the energy and the fun and the focus on plot and entertainment uh that 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 came before that came before it that you that you had in the pulp and the golden age yeah Yeah. i yeah i think that's right i i I should say though that like the planet stories you know weird tales epoch is pre-campbell right like it's a separate yeah, movie. It is. That's true. Uh, so we need to make sure we delineate that. Yeah. But, Campbell um, is uh, astound, uh, Astounding Stories. That's Golden Age. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he comes in sort of in the middle. Yeah. Um, a question here from Logan that we've been ignoring. Uh, Dave cool. and me specifically, when you craft characters and plot, is it difficult to avoid letting tropes and beats that are commonly used in movies and things from uh, creeping into your work? Uh, you first, man. Um, uh. In an interview, Nick Cave was asked about cliches and said, a cliche is an idea that's so powerful you can't escape it. Um, I I don't worry too much about it. It happens. I think if I if I found myself obviously mimicking the most recent Avengers film, I would be embarrassed. Um, I, I don't think I do. To some extent, all literature is in dialogue with other literature. Um, and, um, I also think that, uh, your first novel is very likely regardless to basically be an imitation of some kind. The first thing you write, the first, maybe it's not a novel you finish, right? Maybe it's short stories, but I think, uh, I think to some degree that is, uh, that is, uh, that is unavoidable. Um, and maybe, Craft is the uh, 
the set of skills by which you disguise the fact that you are repeating beats that have been that have appeared in other stories. Yeah, I I pretty much feel the same way. I think that I I said earlier right that these these cliches like the chosen one right uh, these tropes are inescapable in part because they're true, right? Uh, you know there are uh, people who you know whether or not you believe in in God or anything right who are in the right place at the right time and whose efforts could not be replicated by another person are all over the history books. It's become very unpopular to look at people like that, right? Uh, in part because, you know, it's often military heroes and people think we've given them too much attention in the history departments of the West uh, for so long, but um, but for other reasons too. Uh, nevertheless, like those people exist, right? And those people matter uh, and everybody matters, right? Uh, everybody's chosen to do something, right? Uh, you know, and that might be, you know, that might be within a limited range of things, right? You might, you might do one or two things, but I, I don't really worry about it, right? Like if I, uh, you know, often I have hung a lampshade, as they said, on the fact that I have, uh, I've been riffing on something, right? I will go, uh, right to it and just say that, yeah, yeah, I did that. Right. And, and, and that's okay, specifically because what like art and culture is is a conversation right and so revisiting these things is is important i yeah. think um liam asks a really short question uh is book of the new sun on the list of greats yes yes <laughs> short answer yeah done um 100 you want to talk about deep roots uh yeah. we had a question for you though uh oh i missed a cory one hang on uh new wave uh it was the new way of basically saying the important part of sci-fi is the phi part then pretty uh, much i i agree with that i think it yeah, was that's a good way to put it it was an attempt to focus on inner space rather than outer space consciousness uh angst uh you know psychological uh the, the psychological needs of characters um our insecurities things like that um yeah i think that's yeah we've got writers like zelazny and herbert right and and um and Le Guin too right and that's sort of their whole thing right the the and that's partially you know it's the 60s right it's drugs uh it's clearly drugs in <laughs> case of a few of them right uh and uh and so yeah you know um <laughs> you know it's yeah. interesting as we kind of talk about this if you think about um, if you superimpose this conversation we're having over, say, the list of genres that are identified by having shelf tags in a Barnes and Noble, right? There's a, I think there's a complete disconnect. Um, and I don't, I don't know that I have anywhere to go with this thought, except that I think booksellers have been shoving things together that are like only in the most superficial ways. These are the stories that have ray guns. These are the stories that have like steampunk is probably the most egregious example. It's it seems to be purely an aesthetic. Um, and uh, but but I'm not sure that fantasy is treated any differently by booksellers or sci fi or mystery or anything else. This is uh, my essential frustration, right, is that none of these are genres. This is why I hate the what is grimdark panel. Uh, it's not a genre. It's a collection of tropes and an aesthetic. Right, most of these things are that right. It's an a attitude. genre, right, is something like romance. Right, it's a adventure. It's mystery. It's a kind of story. Right, uh, it's a format, and we don't we don't do that in science fiction because science fiction fantasy can do any and all of those things because there's something like above genre. Right, they're like a mode or like a super genre. And, and so what people are talking about when they talk about these little movements and cyberpunk, steampunk are both really good examples of this is we're actually talking about like specific writers in a specific period of time, right? We're talking about with, with cyberpunk, we're talking about Bruce Sterling, we're talking about William Gibson, and we're talking about the mid eighties, right? And we, when we talk about genre in art, right? We totally understand this, right? We talk about movements. We talk about the impressionists. We talk about, you know, I don't know, cubism, right? <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, it, it's these moments, right? And it, it, it was kind of like that in literature. We talked about the romantics, right? And there's the gothic movement in the, the, a little bit after that, right? 
And, but as soon as we got in here, it's less like uh, it's less like that, and it's more like trying to give everything its own D and D class, right? And then like writers will talk about their books like they're multi-classing. They're like, well, my book is a, you know, uh, and I do this too to try and communicate with people who are used to speaking in this language. Uh, you know, they'll be like, my book is a cyberpunk gothic space opera. Uh, and people are like, ooh, I like all of those words in that order or any order. And, uh, and but what you're talking about isn't the kind of story at all. You're talking about the aesthetics. Um and it frustrates me that like nobody even knows what the word genre means, right? <laughs> like it's 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 so weird. It's like someone knocked the Tower of Babel down when my back was turned. Uh, and uh, and it's it's fascinating because steampunk's the same way. It was it was Powers and it was it was Jeter and it was Blaylock and it was those three guys who were trying to be anti cyberpunks, right? And it and nobody even knows. Nobody knows that chapter of of of, uh, of our art form's history anymore, um, so it's it's so bizarre to me. Um, but we've got there's a question for you here, Dave. The Autark Severian uh, inquires. Speaking of New Sun, uh, how do you go about researching for your books? Uh, feels like there's a weird blending of history and fantasy in them, and that blows uh, blows Severian away. And I can't answer this because I like don't do research. I just like keep stuff in my head and pull it out when I feel like it. Because I am making up my settings in a way that you're, you know, not you trying to be in a place. Yeah. Um, I do occasionally do specific pieces of research. Um, if I want to know, if I want a scene to happen in a kind of a Nashville that feels like it's a version of real Nashville, I want it to follow the logic of Nashville streets. So I'll try and figure out what those are, right? Um, but, uh, um, mostly what I do, um, well, or so for example, I'm not sure, I'm not entirely certain what series you're talking about, but if you're referring to the witchy war, I spend a silly number of hours learning American languages, um, to be able to, um, represent them on the page with some accuracy, uh, and, and, American languages I use fairly widely, uh, right? There's Hebrew and Greek and Latin in there, and Dutch and German and French and Spanish uh, and uh, Catalan and Ojibwe and others, right? Um, so, like, that's a kind of a research I do. Um, and, or, like, look, I spent a lot of time kind of reading about Algonquian culture. They didn't, it felt false to me. In the same way that it would feel false to me to tell an epic about America in which the Bible was absent, because so many Americans have seen and still see themselves as being present in the biblical epic, right? It felt false to me to tell a story about the, an epic story about America, but have Native American peoples all at the sidelines. So I said, I, I got to get, I got to bring somebody in to have a point of view character, and that involved spending a lot of time reading, right? But more than that, what I just do is read an awful lot, and uh, and I will write down. I have a the file grows a uh, list of sort of things I want to remember that I've learned about mound builder sites or uh, you know um, odd moments in American history or whatever. And I go back and as I'm as I'm working on the books, I'll I'll be using that as part of the fodder i'm turning into the story but i really value thank you it's very it's, i i i feel very honored i really value that feeling um uh that a reader would get it is of course it is of course complete sleight of hand right i mean to to a to someone someone earlier said we should you should do christopher a thing about world building um really world building is misnamed you never build the world it's it's it should be called something like world presenting, right? How do you how do you present the right mix of details and broad picture so that without slowing the story down, people feel like, ah, oh, this is a real place, and I might wake up tomorrow and be there. Yeah. Um, th thank you very much. Yeah. So that's that's always an interesting one too, right? Because people don't get that like readers do all of the heavy lifting, right? The, the trick is like giving people enough 
uh, to like go and finish the painting in their own heads. And so it's like a lot of a lot of world building is just giving people the suggestion that you've done a lot more planning than you have uh, in a convincing way. Uh, and that's not to say that you shouldn't do stuff that's never on the page, right? But like a lot of, I think, um, where a lot of like new writers misstep, right? Including probably myself, uh, is uh, they they don't trust the reader far enough, right? And they feel this need to over explain things. And and part of that, I think, uh, is because the idea of writing a D and D tie-in manual is really exciting, right? Um, you know, and, and so <laughs> it's, um, you know, you, you want to go and, and, and talk about the intricate court customs of this place that's going to be in book seven and you haven't written book one yet, right? And, uh, and you don't need to do that um, because all you need to do is say that that court exists and the reader will confabulate a lot of that in their own heads. And you can do that by suggesting, and, this, and by suggesting the word jihad instead of crusade, right? Uh, you know, by doing that, Frank Herbert is suggesting this is a very Islamic future, right? And by taking that away, the movie erased that, right? Uh, which is, uh, you know, upsetting for all of the reasons I outlined earlier. Uh, perhaps not very well. But, um, but you know, like you can do a lot with just little word choices like that. And people will, will spiral out and they will make their own conclusions. And it's amazing uh, how little you actually like have to do. Uh, you know, to build a world in your reader's head because that's where you're building it. It's not on the page. It's in it's in the reader's head. So that's absolutely right. Yeah, Jay, uh, Jay Mashuzu, I like your I like your uh, your question. I think the shift is away from knowing things and being able to interrogate things and towards being able to index databases. And the basic problem with that is that I think the databases are subject to corruption of all kinds. Uh, like knowing how to Google something is nothing because Google, the, the Google's not designed to tell you a right answer in any case. Google is designed to point you at the most popular answer. Uh, and, uh, and so replacing knowing things with, with facility, with apps, I think is a real, real danger. Yeah, of course, you know, uh, so I always think about Plato when people, when people bring this up, right. Complaining about writing. Uh, which, of course, we survived, right? But at the cost of, you know, once upon a time, every child in Athens knew the Iliad, right? Uh, you know, at least at least the boys did. And and that is a loss, right? It's at least a difference. And I, I do worry that this isn't even more revolutionary and dangerous, right? That we're offloading our own internal, you know, memory storehouses to, you know, server banks in uh, California somewhere. And... Um, well, this gets to that that gulf between us and the ancients, and I think it raises an interesting question: Are we human in the same sense in which Plato understood humans? And I think that there is an argument that we're not, right? And I think yeah. this is this is a very this is this is the kind of thing fantasy should be written about. That's what Christopher's. That's like if I could pick, oh, you know, if I could pick three themes. Uh, that make the list. A sun eater. That would be that would make the list. One of the themes is the kind of ship of Theseus question, or to even evade the kind of what do they call it object metaphysics question uh, of ship of Theseus is just this question of how much can you tinker with, how much can you augment, how much can you edit a, a person's genes, or how much can you add on to them or take away from them before they're not fundamentally human anymore? And, and they're, if they're not fundamentally human anymore, then what, what, what makes, what makes us better than the Cielsen? And so uh, maybe you could speak to that, Christopher. Um, well, I, I mean, I think you did, you know, you said it, I think you said it as well as I could have, right. I, um, yeah, I, I wonder, I wonder about those things. And I do think that even if we are, you know, like I think Plato would recognize us as human, right? But he might not recognize how we human in the sense of the word that my generation uses, uh, you know, as a verb. I, I think that certainly is the being part of human is uh, of human being is something that I think has been clouded in the last twenty five hundred years ways. Certainly in the last two hundred. Um, uh, let's see, Jay says, Hadrian's uh, doubt and questioning of his own humanity is definitely one of the best aspects. Also a Hamlet homage. 
but uh, let's see. We got a question here about Serpent Daughter. Uh, are we uh, are we even the same uh, you know, species if we forget the people that came before us? You said something like that, Serpent Daughter, Dave. Uh -huh. I didn't know I was quoting myself. <laughs> yeah, I find I do that a lot. Uh, quote myself. I quote you too sometimes, but uh, <laughs> I quote myself a lot. Oh, man. We are hitting two hours. I think we've got a couple more questions. We might take them. But in the meantime, uh, Jordan, Dave, you guys, anything you want to uh, tell the audience about where they can find you or um, something you're working on? Uh, well, for me, uh... Go ahead and go over to, if you find the, some of the things that uh, we've been saying interesting or I've been saying interesting, go ahead and go over to uh, iWizard. Uh, it's our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm a full-time teacher, so I try to post as much content as I humanly can, uh, but I, I usually end up getting one to two things per week. Uh, so please subscribe to iWizard if you're interested in some of the themes and ideas and conversations that we've been having. Um, if you become a patron, you can get things like this nice iWizard mug um, and uh, and that sort of thing. You can read my articles uh, and that sort of thing. If you stick around long enough, I am working on a fantasy novel myself. So it's very been very interesting to listen to these masters um, and hear what they've been saying because I too am, I'm an upstart uh, writer trying to produce my first uh, fantasy novel. And so I'll be, you know, if you stick around long enough, I'll be reading little snippets of that. Um, hopefully uh, when it's time to submit that almost done with that uh, should be done with that at the end of this summer. So, you know, just come over to my channel and, uh, and tune in and I'm hoping to build a community of, of people who like what I'm doing and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And I put the link uh, to your channel in the description for folks who want to go check that out. Go give Jordan a, a subscribe. Uh, and if you haven't, you know, hit that button over here too. Um, Dave, what about, what about you? You've got the covers on display, of course. Um, not like the narcissist that I am. Well, uh, I did it too, but like physically. I know that's why I felt comfortable doing it. And I like my posters are upstairs, it would take too long to get them. Um, so I used to be quite active in social media, but for grumpy old man reasons that you can probably imagine, I have basically withdrawn. Uh, but uh, but I am very active with my mailing list, so I send out an emailing a blast deck every Monday pretty reliably. I also, at least once a month, give away books. So uh, if you can tolerate me emailing you four times a month to say, here's my work in process, here's a writing tip, here's, a, here's where I'm going to a convention, for a shot at winning a stack of five free books once a month, my mailing list is, is, is an okay deal. So the URL has been there under, underneath my face the whole time. Yeah, and I have put, uh, I've put that link uh, in the description as well for everybody. Uh, so yeah, uh, we got one more question from uh, from Jay. When is the next roundtable? Thanks so much for doing this, guys. Great to hear your uh, brilliant minds at work. Well, thanks for being here. And thanks everybody for being here. As to the answer to that question, probably sometime next month. I have vague notions that I will do this on a monthly basis alongside the usual Q and A. Speaking of the next uh, Sunday Q and A, will be next week. I will schedule it on the weekend. Uh, at some point, because the rest of this week is sort of sort of full. Uh, but uh, so yeah. I, also, I wanted to say if you've got any uh, suggestions or uh, things we could talk about on the roundtable, I'm going to try to have different people, you know, in in months to come. Probably have both of you guys back at some point. So uh, please do uh, leave a comment after the stream is done, so that it doesn't get lost in the live stream. Uh, you know, scroll uh, uh, what you'd like to see in the next uh, maybe the next topic or two. I've got a couple ideas, but I'm happy to hear what you all want to hear about. So until until then, everybody, thank you again for being here. We have a wonderful week. Uh, Dave, Jordan, thank you for coming on. And until next time, everybody, stay well.